Okay, so this section is going to take a look at experiments. So in the last section, we took a look at taking a sample. This section, we're going to say, okay, now that we have an, a sample, a simple random sample of a group of from the population, what can we do with that sample in order to make inferences about the population using experiments? All right, so when you're done with this section, you should be able to understand the difference between observational studies and experiments, describe the language of experiments. So this is a very, very vocabulary heavy section, and you really wanna make sure you understand the difference between the language of experiments and samplings, because it's very important that you keep them separate. There are three important principles of experimental design, and then by by the end, you'll be able to design an experiment using completely randomized design, randomized block design, and a matched pairs design, which we'll get into in this section. All right, so um, first thing we're going to talk about is the difference between an observational study and an experiment. So the major difference is with observational studies, you're not imposing any sort of treatment on them. So sort of the people have make, made the choices that they've made, they've run the miles that they've done, they've looked at the, you know, internet for five hours a day, whatever. You're not telling them to do something, they've already done it, and then you are just looking at the results of something somebody has already done. You are not choosing to impose any sort of treatment on them. Whereas with experiments, they um, don't just observe individuals or ask them questions, they actively impose some sort of treatment in order to measure their response. So they would say, go run three miles, what happens to your blood pressure? You go run five miles, what happens to your blood pressure? Not just saying, oh, these people already here already chose to run three miles. You are telling somebody what to do with an experiment. All right, so an observational study observes individuals and measures variables of interest but doesn't attempt to influence the response, okay? So it's used to describe groups, compare groups, or examine a relationship. So basically, just keep in mind, observational study, you're not imposing or telling anybody to do anything. However, an experiment deliberately imposes some sort of treatment on an individual to measure their responses. So we tell one person to run three miles, one person to run five miles, and then measure their responses. With an observational study, they've just chosen to do that, and you're gonna take a look and see what happens. You're not telling them what to do. Okay, now, when our goal is to understand cause and effect, experiments are the only way in order to do this. So observational studies, you cannot do cause and effect. You can just say maybe there's an association, but we can't say that one caused another. So the major distinction between an observational study and experiment, that is one of the most important things in statistics, is to be able to understand what you have here. If it's observational, we can't do cause and effect, but if it's experimental and it's designed correctly, we potentially can um, say that one caused another to happen. All right, so being able to distinguish between an observational study and experiment is one of the most important things that you're gonna do in statistics. With an observational study, we use the sample survey to collect data, okay? We could potentially be watching the behavior of bears in the winter and summer, watching how students act in the hallways during the transition at schools, all right? So we're just watching something occur. We're not imposing any sort of treatment. With an experiment, you're imposing a treatment to get a response. So does listening to music hurt students' ability to concentrate? So you would make students listen to music or not listen to music, okay? Would teenagers return to Ten dollars if they were given extra change at the store. So that would be you would be physically giving ten dollars extra, and then some people you wouldn't be. So what is healthier, a low fat diet or a low carb diet? All right. So you want to um, you would make pe some people have a low fat diet and some people have a low carb diet. Although I think the new research is that high fat diets of good fats are actually the best. All right. So go ahead and take a minute and read this. And I want you to think about whether this is experimental or observational study and think about why. Okay, so the question is, what did you think? Hopefully, Okay, do you drink coffee? This is good for me because I do drink coffee. Um, hopefully you said this is an observational study. Why? Okay, why is it observational? Because they weren't imposing any sort of treatment. They weren't telling one group to drink coffee, one 
group not to drink coffee and then comparing the results, all right, they were just literally looking at whether or not a certain group had already chosen to drink coffee, all right? Now, since it was observational, we can't be sure that drinking coffee is the cause of a longer life. It could be something else associated with drinking coffee that is the cause. And we're gonna talk about what those things are um, in the next few slides. And we want to sort of think about the questions, what was the reason that coffee drinkers live longer? Was it the coffee? Could it be that they exercised more? So there's a lot of things to take into consideration. So when you see a survey or a study and they've come up with some sort of conclusion, you want to constantly, you know, in the news be thinking about, hey, well, what kind of study was this? Was this observational? Can we actually say that drinking coffee is the cause of longer life? Or you know, maybe this, these two are just associated and let's look a little bit further into this. All right, so here's a few examples to try. Um, just go ahead and try these three and see how you do. Um, the answers are there. So um, just go ahead and take a minute and try that. Hit pause and then hit play when you're ready to see the answers. Okay, first one was a little bit tricky. It was actually an observational study. The key is that the researchers didn't force the veterans to have PTSD. They simply observed the rate of heart disease for the soldiers who did have PTSD and those who did not. All right, the second one wasn't also an observational study. The key here is that the individuals sampled were just asked what was important to them. They didn't try to impose some sort of conditions or some sort of treatment for a set amount of time to see if the conditions affected their response. And the last one, hopefully, you figured out that this was a designed experiment, but here's why. The key is that they gave a treatment. They forced individuals to keep a certain diet and then compared the participants' health at the end. Okay, so did they force them to do something or were they just asking the questions, observing what already happened? All right, so this one's actually an interesting one. Um, this is this is where we want to take a look at this and see if this was an observation versus an experiment. So, does taking horm hormones reduce heart attack after? heart attack risk after menopause. So the question is, should women take hormones as an estrogen after menopause when the natural production of these hormones ends? So in 1992, several major organizations said yes. So women who took home hormones seemed to reduce their risk of heart attack by 35% to 50%. The risks of taking hormones appeared small compared to the benefits. Now read that carefully and think about was this an observation or was this an experiment, okay? Did they tell people to take hormones versus not or did they just look at people that had already taken them? The evidence in favor of taking the hormone replacement came from a number of observational studies um, that compared women who were taking hormones to those who were not, all right? So they, they didn't actually do an experiment. So just remember, if you don't do an experiment, you can't establish cause and effect, although People will try to publish it and say that it does. But the women who chose to take the hormones were richer and better educated and saw doctors more often than those who didn't. Now, think about that. If you're richer and more educated and you take these hormones, you're probably doing other things to better maintain your health. So maybe you eat a better diet, maybe you exercise more, so on and so forth. In order to get convincing data to decide whether or not hormone replacements and heart attacks were related, you would have to do some sort of an experiment. The experiments don't let the women decide, take it or don't take it. They assign women to either the hormone replacement pills or placebo pills that look the same as the hormone pills. All right, so that means you're gonna get a simple random sample, and that random sample would consist of women that were rich and educated, and women maybe that were not as wealthy and not as educated, so it's gonna include a wide range of women so that we can't say something else like diet, going to the doctor more often, actually caused the decreased amount of heart attacks, okay? So what they did, the assignment is done by a coin toss so that all kinds of women are equally likely to get either treatment. By 2002, several experiments with women of different ages agreed that hormone replacement does not reduce the risk of heart attacks, okay? So when they did the experiment, it sort of overturned the, their um, conclusions from the observation. They concluded that the first studies were wrong and 
taking hormones after menopause quickly fell out of favor. So let's just take a look and see what are some of the important aspects of this experiment. Number one, there's an explanatory variable. What is that? So it's exactly what it says. It helps to explain or predict the changes in a response variable. So it's often the treatment in the experiment. In this case, it was whether or not they took hormones. The response variable is what happens based on the explanatory variable. So the explanatory variable is what's gonna make the change, hormone treatments versus not. Response variable, in this case, you wanna be specific, it's measuring the outcome of the student measuring the outcome of the response, or sorry, of the experiment. In this case, it was whether or not they had a heart attack. All right, now, there's some other questions, okay, that could be answered. Did the women who took hormones visit their doctor more often? Did they exercise more often? Was hormone replacement or the fact that they exercise more often the reason for the less heart attacks? When you can't answer the question, what caused the response? What caused the decreased amount of heart attacks? Was it the exercise or was it the hormones? That is called confounding. So confounding means you got a response, okay? There was a decreased amount of heart attacks, but confounding says we're not actually sure what caused that response. Was it the exercise or was it the actual heart attacks? All right, observational studies on the effect of one variable on another often fail because of confounding variables between the explanatory variable and one or more lurking variables. So I know this is tricky. Think of confounding as like a verb. You can't decide what causes the decreased amount of heart attacks. Was it the exercise or was it the hormone replacement pills? Now, the lurking variables is a variable that's not among the explanatory response variable, but it influences the response, all right? So in this case, the lurking variable was the exercise or the diet, all right? So that's kind of behind the background. It's sort of lurking in the background. But confounding occurs when the two variables are associated, the diet and the exercise that are the lurking variables, in a way that we don't know if the response is from the treatment or if it's from the lurking variable. So think about you need to identify the lurking variable and then see, okay, does that lurking variable cause confounding? So what well-designed experiments try to do is they try to say, okay, well, what are the potential lurking variables? Let's try to account for those some way. All right, in this case, the lurking variable could have been the exercise of the diet. This caused confounding. So this allowed us to say, hey, well, we don't know if it was the exercise that caused the decreased amount of heart attacks or was it actually the drug? All right. What's important? So oftentimes on the AP exam, you'll be asked to identify a confounding variable and you have to be able to do the following. Number one, explain how the variable you chose is associated with the explanatory variable and explain how the variable you chose affects the response variable. So um, here's an example. So women who take hormone pills may be more worried about their health and therefore tend to exercise more. So you're, you're sort of linking the lurking variable and the treatment Okay, that's showing how exercise is associated with the explanatory variable. All right, we're showing if you take hormone pills, then you could potentially want to exercise more. That's linking the two. Therefore, since women exercise more, they're less likely to have a heart attack. And that tells us how exercise affects the response. So you wanna link the lurking variable to the response and then explain how the lurking variable can to the response. All right, now here's an example of what would get no credit. If you just said exercise is a confounding variable, what does that tell us? It doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us an association to the explanatory variable. So you want to be able to explain how exercise is connected to the hormone pill. All right, and then how exercise will affect the heart attack. All right, so you're going to connect it to both the explanatory and the response variable. All right, so Let's say that you think diet's a confounding variable. What's wrong with the following statement? Diet's a confounding variable because people with bad diets are more likely to have a heart attack. Well, that is that linking diet to the hormone pill and then linking diet to the response. It doesn't explain how diet's associated with the explanatory variable, hormone pills, and it doesn't explain how it's associated to the response. So take a minute and try to rewrite it correctly. Okay, 
So let's see how this is rewritten correctly. Women who take hormone pills are more likely to care about their health and about a healthy diet. Linking the diet to the explanatory variable. Since they have a healthy diet, they're more likely to have less heart attacks. Linking the diet to the response.